It's good to see all of you today. We want to welcome you and thank you for coming to celebrate Dad's life with us. It means the world that you've chosen to be here today. As we look around, we see a lot of relatives. We see a lot of friends and a lot of colleagues. Uh, some have come from near and many have come from far. Thank you. Uh, we want to welcome also uh, those that are watching live stream today, especially mom and dad's dear friends down at Port Charlotte, Florida, a church that we grew up in and they had their membership until a little bit over five years ago. But um, Port Charlotte, our hearts are with you. Thank you for watching and honoring dad with us today. As a family, we've thought, what would be most fitting? What, um, what would honor dad and what would honor God the most this afternoon? Uh, we got to talking and since uh, it's nearing the end of the Sabbath, it seemed most natural for us to have a sense of family worship. In our home through the years, these are tears of joy. In our home through the years, this was special. So today, we invite you into the living room, as it were, mom at the piano. We think we're gonna sing, <laughs> and we're gonna invite you to sing with us, please. Because today it's about celebrating God and his goodness, his promises, and I pray that they will be stronger in our hearts and minds because of the time we spend here today. So in just a few minutes, uh, or in a few moments, if all goes well, the slides will be on the screen with the lyrics and we'll invite you to sing with us as we start this worship time. But just before that, we'll have prayer. It's a privilege to be in your house today, Father, to celebrate the life of one of your truly remarkable men. And we invite your Holy Spirit to fill this place, Lord, to inspire and encourage everyone within the sound of our voices, because we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Abide with me, fast falls the eventide, the darkness deepens, Lord with me.
the last week has been <clears throat> quite, uh, <clears throat> quite a journey. I've actually enjoyed talking to many friends and family about their memories of our dad. And so here we have his, his story, his life sketch. On August 12, 1936, Robert Dale Lang made his grand entrance into the world and into the lives of his parents, Gideon Lang and Louise Wohl. His grandfathers, Chris Lang and Peter Wohl, were Germans who immigrated from Russia to the United States in the late 1800s. These German families settled in the cold, snowy, rural plains of North Dakota, which may be the reason for the incredible sparse population in that region of the country. Consequently, the social life was quite limited. So perhaps out of necessity, but we'd like to think out of love. This resulted in the marriage of three Lang brothers to three Lang sisters. Whoa, sister. I'm sorry, I said... <laughs> 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 okay, so the nerves did get to me. <laughs> so so the three the three Lang brothers was Gideon, John and Sam, and Louise, Sophia, and Amelia. Wool. Yes. I think we have that now. <laughs> Which then resulted in which then resulted <clears throat> in this closely knit family of Langs and Wolves. Louise, Louise and Gideon's second child, Kent, died to SIDS, or su suspected sudden infant death syndrome. Consequently, this left Bob as the only brother to three sisters. His oldest sister, Jean, has passed and his sisters, Jan Olson and Kathy McKee, are here with us today. Growing up on the North Dakota farm was a way of life that shaped Bob. He began working with his dad in the fields at a very early age. At, by the age of six, he was driving the farm equipment. Bob had a particular love for two of the farm animals. Champ was a small pony Bob loved to ride bareback. Champ was fast and ran like the wind. He was a convenient and speedy ride to school. <laughs> Mike, the other favored farm animal, was a very large and strong horse. Sister Jan remembers on cold wintry days, many of the 15 double cousins would hop in the sleigh as Mike would taxi them all the way to school. As Bob continued to grow into his teenage years, it was clear that he had a love for other animals and a love for his sisters. Sister Kathy remembers when she was four to five years of age, Bob was home from Cheyenne River Academy. He had been working in the fields alongside his dad since sunup. As the sun was setting, he found Kathy in the yard. He said, I brought you something then proceeded to slowly pulling out a tiny baby rabbit he had found stranded in the fields. He said, I thought you might like this. Perhaps you could nurse it back to health. Kathy was so happy with the surprise and determined she would take good care of the rabbit she named Abigail. The Lord started working on Bob's heart during his time at Cheyenne River Academy, and he made the decision to be baptized, acknowledging his desire to follow Jesus. The next fall, Bob headed to Union College in Lincoln, Nebraska. Up to this point, he had only been out of his home state once. That was on his senior class trip when they literally drove to the border and stepped over the line into Minnesota just so they could say they left North Dakota. And that was the entirety of their class trip. That year, there was a bumper crop which allowed his dad to purchase a brand new 56 Dodge Cornet. Bob described the car like this. It was a very nice car with a deep throaty rumble that only a V8 could produce. And as he was ready to load up and head to school, his dad said, with no particular emotion or fanfare, 
in German fashion, you take the Dodge, son. It didn't take Bob long to accept that offer. <laughs> At Union College, his cousins, Daryl and Roger, were also enrolled. At this point, we should tell you that Bob had become better known as Butch and Roger as Curly. Clearly in the 50s, the cool cat nicknames were in. One night, early in 1957, Butch and Curly took his Dodge and went to the ice capades downtown Lincoln. As they were walking to their car afterwards, they heard a couple of girls calling, Butch, Curly. They knew one of the girls from Cheyenne River and the other girl, Retha Griffin, from her musical appearances on campus. The girls had missed the bus back to the girls' dorm. So Retha hopped in the front seat and they visited amiably all the way home. He learned she was from Loma Linda, California, and he told her he would be heading to Loma Linda University in the fall to take physical therapy. And for some reason, Retha decided at that very moment, she too would head back to California and finish her musical degree at La Sierra. So in the fall of 1957, <clears throat> Bob headed to Loma Linda to start physical therapy. He recounts the memory like this. I was out getting acquainted with the Loma Linda area, going where the streets led me, and lo and behold, who should I see by her car but little Miss Songbird from Union College days. <laughs> Some weeks later, the dean's secretary invited he and a classmate to a Saturday night gathering. Bob recalled, when we arrived, the other invitees were only her daughter, Bev, and Retha. Well, it didn't take this North Dakota farm boy long to figure out what her agenda was. She had clearly been vetting the boys and had decided that Ed was the one for her daughter and that I would do for Retha. Well, of the options in the situation, Ed and I agreed with her pairing. After the party, Retha and I had an enjoyable, lengthy visit into the wee hours. They saw each other periodically over the next two years, and he would see her when she performed the soprano solos at the Loma Linda University Church for Christmas and Easter. Bob shared, all in all, I was quite impressed with her. However, as one might expect, there were on campus many other young ladies that bore investigation before making a final decision. In the spring of his final year of physical therapy, Retha called, stated she wanted to talk to him, and Bob shared this. I thought, that it, I thought, what could it possibly be? Well, I found out soon enough, and it was a bombshell. She stated that she had been dating a postgraduate fellow at La Sierra, and he had proposed. Furthermore, that he was a fine, principled, and dependable man, and she was prepared to accept. Bob said, I was stunned, shell-shocked. You see, after all the research and investigation of the other maidens at my school, I had been thinking all along that Retha was the one. At the thought of her married to someone else, I became aware of an incredibly achy, empty sensation welling up in my chest. You see, none of the other girls could hold a candle to her. So two months later, on June 9, 1959, just two days after Bob's graduation from physical therapy at Loma Linda and Retha's graduation with her music degree from La Sierra, they were married. Once married, Bob and Retha wasted no time in starting their family. Just 13 months later, Todd Brentley was born. One year later came along Robert Kelly. Three years after that, Mari Jean was born, and 11 and a half months following Mari came Roy Christopher. So four kids in five years. While Bob enjoyed physical therapy, he realized it was not his final professional calling. So with four kids under five, he decided to go back to school to pursue a medical degree there in Loma Linda. In the summer of 1969, Bob graduated from Loma Linda and accepted an, in, an internship at Florida Hospital in Orlando. After his one-year internship, hospital administrator Jack Weisberg 
called and offered Bob a position as the first Seventh-day Adventist physician at a newly acquired Adventist hospital in Punta Gorda, Florida. Bob worked as an ER doc there for two years, and in 1972, he and a colleague, Dr. Shedd, purchased office space together, and Bob established his private practice there. His physical therapy degree, along with his medical degree, was a huge blessing to his patients, and as he was able to provide such holistic counsel and care, his professional career included serving as chief of staff and medical director at Punta Gorda Medical Center and medical director of the rehab center. In the late 1980s, practicing medicine the way he felt was best for his patients became difficult with the change in insurance companies and the bureaucracies that uh, are all too present even now. Bob determined it was time to consider other alternatives. So Dr. Emil Domoff, a medical director for the Florida prison system, invited Bob to join their team. He, uh, Dr. Dama shared with us, Bob was an incredible help to the clinic and he valued the time he spent with him learning practical application of clinical medicine. Bob worked at Charlotte and DeSoto County Correctional Institutions full time for nearly 10 years. So that was Bob's professional life. What about his family, community, and his church life? When the Langs moved to Southwest Florida, the Port Charlotte SDA Church had about 30 members. Right away, Retha began sharing her musical gifts and started a choir. She was a great recruiter. She also started a community choir, the Liberty Singers, that provided music and culture for Charlotte County. As Retha's musical programs grew in attendance, so did their needs for larger venues and technical support. Bob took on this task and quickly learned how to run and manage the sound systems, which he did for the next 35 years. Bob's willingness to help his newfound skills also became beneficial to their Port Charlotte church, and for many years he enjoyed assisting the church's AV team. In 1971, Bob and Retha decided to purchase 22 acres of orange grove on the banks of Myrtle Creek. Bob carefully plotted and visioned the custom home down to how it would be positioned on the property. There was an ideal build site with a westerly view located on the curve of the winding creek that was elevated above the swamp and alligators below. Todd clearly remembers he and Rob helping their dad reposition the stakes that marked the footprint of the house. He could see that if he designed it just right, there would be many a spectacular sunset over the creek, reflecting beautifully into their home. This Florida farm became affectionately known as the Langarosa by the family. You can't take the farm boy, sorry, you can't take the farm out of the farm boy. And this Florida farm was not only a blessing to Bob, but to the entire family. During the building process, Todd and Rob remember their dad waking them up before sunup with, up and at em, boys, <laughs> or roll out, it's time to go to work. On the way to the new property, they often had to stop by the hospital for dad to make daily rounds. He would say, I'll just be 15 or 20 minutes. <laughs> he deeply cared for his patients, and as a result, those few minutes turned into two or three hours. Rob and Todd were 10 and 11 years old and full of energy. They climbed and became well acquainted with every tree in the vicinity. Eventually, they ran out of trees to climb. What else could be done to occupy their time? So one day, they entered the emergency room and found a couple of wheelchairs in the hall. To the amusement of the nurses, they proceeded to have wheelchair races. And yes, it was their rendition of Days of Thunder around the hospital halls. Once the house was built, there was still work to do. As on any farm, we will still remember the sticky little needles that stuck to our sweaty skin working out in the orange grove in the hot summer sun. Cane grass was a particularly pesky, large weed with dense roots, and they were difficult to pull out. Pulling cane grass would have been punishment for most, 
but for dad, it was part of the training ground necessary to teach his kids how to get hard work done. Now as adults, we are thankful for the work ethic that our dad ingrained in us. All of us have learned and applied these principles in our adult lives and can unanimously thank dad for this gift. Bob wasn't all about work though. It seemed, <clears throat> it did seem it at the time. <laughs> there was plenty of time for enjoying the fruits of their labor on the wide open spaces of the 22 acres. Dirt biking, four wheeling, horseback riding to name a few. Many of Thanksgiving and New Year's celebrations were hosted out on the Langarosa for the church family. Hay rides, bonfires, hot dogs, hot chocolate were enjoyed <clears throat> by all. The family still remembers most of the five acres in front of the house covered with cars as people came and enjoyed these events. Worship and singing around the bonfire were a rich time. These will never be forgotten. It comes in waves. You never know when it's coming. <clears throat> These will never be forgotten. The family enjoyed this home and property along with our extended church family for 42 years. Bob was not only a hardworking farmer, physical therapist, and medical doctor, he was also a designer. He designed and built many a useful tool, a special dolly to move Retha's grand piano when they moved up uh, to Tennessee here, a special hydraulic claw for, for moving uh, railroad ties that helped to hold the bank behind their house to keep it from washing away. And uh, he also had a special carrier to haul retaining wall block down the hill behind Robin Velvet's home. But not only was he a designer and builder of useful tools, he was also the ultimate fun master. He designed a water slide down the north hill of the Langarosa, a dirt sled pulled behind the pickup truck or four-wheeler, and a dunking tank for the church school fall, fall uh, festivals. Through the years, he personally practiced the holistic advice he gave to patients, ever consummate picture of health, always fit and trim. He strived to eat healthy, even eating dry toast with nothing on it. <laughs> Retha often provided healthy dishes, uh, creatively disguising her garbanzos and pancakes. Uh, even before garbanzos were a thing. After a life of treating symptoms and critical care ma uh, medicine, Bob's energy in preventive medicine and, and preventing the eight laws, presenting the eight laws of health became his greater passion. He really enjoyed comparing notes with me and his niece, uh, Dr. Denise Smith, in this regard. Bob was never one for memberships at an exercise gym. For work on the Langarosa was his exercise. Just five years ago, I was over helping mom and dad <clears throat> get their place ready to, to sell. <clears throat> and uh, there was a particularly large pile of gravel um, that uh, needed to be moved. And it was probably 10 or 12 feet in diameter and three or four feet high. And, we were shoveling it into, into a trailer. And um, so as Germans do, we were, we were shoveling away, the not a word was being spoken. And uh, <clears throat> I'm, I, I've, got, I've got this thought in my mind, remember he's like 78, 79, somewhere around in there. I start, I thought, you know, dad's in pretty good health. I think I'll pick up the pace a little bit. And so I sure did. And, you know what, just like he has for the last 15 or 20 years, he kept pace with me and I wondered if I was gonna make it to the end. <laughs> That's my dad. <clears throat> so, you know, he did, one of the exercise things that we did do together um, that are great memories, I'll, I, I will never forget them, is, um, we had some friends that, that convinced me to go do a, a marathon back in 1992, and it was such a great experience at New York City. I said, Dad, you should, you should do this. And so he and Chris and I went and, and ran it, and, and uh, 
it was just a wonderful experience. The following year, 94, uh, uh, we went and, and Rob and Chris and I, the four of us, did it together. What great memories that is for us. Bob had a heart for service and devotion to help others. <clears throat> just a few of the areas he volunteered for through the years were uh, community stop smoking plans. That was back in the 70s. He, uh, when we were growing up as teenagers, Pathfinder director, Sabbath school teacher, school board chair, church elder. Uh, uh, you heard about the uh, doing sound for Liberty Singers. Uh, construction and, and uh, medical support in Bolivia and Peru, Costa Rica. That year he went to a, a location that even the police wouldn't go and the Lord kept him safe and people got to hear the message that probably wouldn't have been able to hear it otherwise. Medical clinic and health lectures both in Bonaire and Botswana. Uh, he did Creation Health with me uh, for several of the events down in, in Florida. <clears throat> the, in his later years, the, our community health center in Port Charlotte. The Pathways to Health, uh, many of you have heard of those. Uh, um, he was involved with three of those. And Cohetta Springs. We have so many great family history, uh, family memories from Cohetta Springs and different projects uh, helping Rob together as a family and dad being right there in the middle of it. Prison ministries, uh, he is involved with here now, um, uh, carrying on what he started as a physician. He, he's now as a lay person uh, sharing Jesus' love with the prisoners here. And then uh, here at, at the university, uh, Bob certainly loved his family, and, and uh, as each of his four children left home, went to Forest Lake, and then on here to Southern, the Lang family did begin to grow. In 1984, Rob uh, married Velvet uh, McQuiston, and soon they had four children, Kaylee, Breck, Aubrey, and Colton. In 1989, I married my awesome wife, Lucinda MD, and several years later, Julia. Uh, was added to our family. In, in 2000, Mari married Paul Matejcik. Soon they added some twins, and uh, 18 months later, Molly came along. And so our family is full. And, um, and uh, I cannot forget uh, a very, very important part that just came along recently. Rob's oldest daughter, Kaylee, and her husband, Kyle, just had the first great grandbaby, Lorea. And so our, our family that we affectionately call the Lang Gang is continuing to grow. Bob fully invested in all of his children and supported them in every aspect of their lives. Throughout the years, he enjoyed helping his children in various projects. Some examples. He helped Chris rebuild a fence after it got knocked down by a black bear. He's also been a huge supporter of Life Strings Ministries. That's Chris's ministry. He helped Rob in building his home in Oregon for an entire month. He helped Todd complete his optometry office renovation, which included extensive cabinetry. He helped Paul and I when our twins were born. He came with mom and stayed for 10 weeks. He did anything we asked. He changed diapers, he washed <laughs> bottles. He was amazing. Um, he enjoyed participating in every aspect that he could be present for. When Bob and Retha realized that they were becoming slaves to the 22 acres in Florida, because of the never-ending needs and the upkeep of this property, they sold the Langarosa and moved up to Tennessee. We were all but worried, we were all a bit worried that Bob would be bored, retired from his busy medical practice and now without the Langarosa to occupy his productive way of life. We soon, soon learned that worry was a waste of our time, for it didn't take him long to fill his days building large garden boxes in the backyard with an automatic watering system. His goal was to grow enough vegetables to share with the whole neighborhood. He not only sought to find ways to share with neighbors, but also sought ways to share with others beyond the borders of the neighborhood. 
He served as a Southern Adventist University light volunteer. He volunteered transporting elderly and physically disabled members to church, and not forgetting his work with the prison system in Florida, he served in prison ministries, showing the love of Jesus and bringing the word of life to inmates. Recently, Bob and Retha celebrated their 60th wedding anniversary, and they took a trip, took a cruise with treasured friends. They both described this trip as the best one they had ever taken. Shortly after their return, Bob was working on his to-do list and fell from a ladder. His injuries were grave and inoperable. So according to his wishes, we took him home where the family could care for him. All of us were there. The next six days were filled with moments that we will never forget. Precious moments with dad and with each other. We had time to shower him with love and gratitude. We felt God's comfort as we prepared for the inevitable. And on October 29th, he passed very peacefully with all of us surrounding him. What a privilege to be able to say goodbye in this manner. And what a comfort to know that this goodbye will not be for long. Robert Dale Lang lived a full and robust life of service, which was a huge blessing to an untold number of people. He will forever be remembered, loved, and missed. We know he is resting in Jesus until the trumpet sounds. This always happens. I don't think it's going to... All right. What a beautiful life um, of our dear grandfather. Um, and how to, how to summarize, you know, the impact of our grandfather. There really is no way to fully express in a few words, but we all wanted to share a few meaningful moments from the perspective of his grandchildren. Everyone knows, as you heard, that Grandpa was uh, always working. And from my curious little eyes as a child, I remember constantly seeing him uh, down at the Langarosa, fixing, painting, mowing, digging, building, he never stopped. But even amidst the endless to-do list, there was always, uh, there was frequently this moment of realization from us kids that he was actually working so that we could have something fun to do. We loved going to Grandpa and Grandma's because we knew that there would be the best activities planned for us, like canoeing through the Florida Everglades, looking for alligators, building bonfires, taking high rides uh, through the orange grove. It was never a dull moment for us. Grandpa always thought of the most creative ways to entertain the grandchildren when we came to visit. My particular favorite of these inventions was a giant slip and slide off the back of his property. The highlight of that afternoon by far was when Grandpa himself went down the slip and slide, head first, of course. The memories we shared as a family that day will always stay in my heart. Grandpa brought me endless smiles, and for that, I am forever thankful. My favorite memories are encased in those sunny days with Grandpa. The pure joy that I feel radiating through this family is all thanks to him. Grandpa created a dirt sled for us kids, which was perfectly handcrafted in his workshop. It had three handles on each side for Kaylee, Breck, and I to enjoy, and later the rest of the grandchildren got to enjoy it as well. When we were younger, he pulled it behind his tractor, but as we got older, he pulled it behind his four-wheeler. Through the cow pasture, sand dunes, by the creek, and all over the Florida property. This now required goggles. 
we would give him the thumbs up and we would yell faster. It was a blast and honestly quite terrifying. <laughs> he always knew how to put a smile on our face and sometimes dirt in our mouths. <laughs> the dirt sled was not only one of his, or the dirt sled was only one of Grandpa's great inventions. Grandpa not only knew how to have fun and entertain us, he also taught us so much throughout the years that we will treasure forever. Pop up taught me many lessons and set a great example for the type of person that I would want to be when I grow older. My most prominent memory of Pop up is when he taught Molly and I how to fish. While teaching us, Pop up was patient and allowed Molly and I to take our time. He got us hooked on fishing, and Molly and I enjoyed the fishing as a good pastime. In other words, Pop up helps me find a hobby that I would never have found without him. For as long as I had the privilege of knowing my grandfather, he had always been a very hands-on, do-it-yourself kind of guy. He was never afraid of putting in the elbow grease or doing the hard work. I remember a few years ago when we had just moved into our new house and I was obsessed with getting a loft bed. Unfortunately, there wasn't quite enough space for one, so I came up with an idea that I called a loft chair. It was basically a loft bed, but smaller with just enough room to sit up top. I made a sketch of it and showed it to him, and he said, all right, let's do it. So one day, he brought over his gear, and we made it happen. Sorry. The loft chair now sits in the corner of my room and is easily my favorite place in the house. When I was growing up, it was a gift to have grandma and grandpa live close by in Florida. Dad used to tell me stories of when he was a kid growing up on that same property. One Sabbath after church in Port Charlotte, when I was probably just seven or eight, he taught me how to wind up the chords on stage. I wanted to help because from a very young age, I had an instinct that everyone respected him and grandma. And so by nature, I wanted to have that character trait too. This is just one of the several things grandpa taught me during our time together. I'll always remember him as the serious, humored, God-loving man me and my cousins got to call grandpa. A memory that I have from Grandpa is something that is really valuable to me just from a couple years ago. I did landscaping for my next door neighbor and Grandpa let me use his truck to go to the nursery to get mulch. When I got back and started spraying the mulch, he walked out of the house with a shovel and gloves and hopped out back into the back of the truck. I said, what are you doing? And he replied, I'm helping you. I, I know four hands is better than two. He helped me shovel all day while I spread the mulch. A job that, that should have taken two days ended up just taking one. He did stuff like this all the time. When I had a school trip, I would say I was going to find a friend to mow the lawn for me while I was gone, but he would always chirp right up and say, say that he would mow for me. I'd always tell him he didn't need to, but he would insist, oh no, this is good for me. <laughs> I need to stay active. I'd always try to reimburse him for all the hard work he'd do for me, but he'd just say, oh no, save your money, I work for free. <laughs> he'd always talk about how amazing he thought it was that I worked and how I did such a great job whenever I did my work, when I know for a fact I've never worked nearly as hard as he did, and I probably never did the, the quality of work that he had done in his lifetime. Gestures like this taught me so much about how a selfless, godly man should be and how I always should be willing to lend a helping hand no matter if it should benefit me or not. So Grandpa played with us, and as we grew, he adapted with us, and he met our new needs, and with excitement, I'll never forget how his eyes, those bright blue eyes, would sparkle as he would ask us about our life and what was going on, or as he would join us and come alongside us with what was happening in our lives at that time. He was an incredible example to us. His lifestyle, his healthy lifestyle, his work ethic, and the way he spent his time was not missed by our observant eyes and our curious hearts. 
For me, it was his involvement at church that left a lasting impression. While grandma led from the front, grandpa made sure everything was running smoothly from the back in the sound booth. Many Sabbaths, he wouldn't be sitting next to us in the pew, but I could turn around and I would see him sitting in the sound booth, diligently working. Even at a young age, I realized that what we do matters, but it doesn't matter whether it's from the front or from the back. Grandpa was not loud about the way he lived his life, but he was consistent in how he lived it. And so that consistency showed us the characteristics that we wanted to adopt as well. We've learned much from our incredible grandpa, how to work hard, to serve, to be dedicated to family and friends, and even strangers alike. We strive to be like grandpa because in him, we find the very characteristics of Jesus. We love Grandpa so much, and we can't wait to see him soon. Several years ago, I started to experience the blessings and the transforming power through the Holy Spirit from memorizing whole passages and chapters in the Bible. Soon after that, a group was formed that meets once a month to recite scripture together. It's called I Recite. Uh, we describe it as a spiritual potluck. Dad joined me in this journey, and through it, we grew closer as father and son, as friends, and as co-laborers with Christ. One night, Dad joined our group in Orlando, dropped by, and recited James chapter 1. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith brings forth patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Let not that man expect that he will receive anything of the Lord. For he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because he, like the flower of the field, will fade away. For no sooner is the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass. Its flower falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he, for when he is approved, he will receive the crown of life promised by God who loves him. Let no man, when he is tempted, say, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Each man is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire 
is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not, be, do not be deceived, my brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no, in whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we may be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So then, my brethren, let my beloved brethren, let every one of you be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of God does not, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which can save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving, your, deceiving yourselves. For any man who is a hearer but not a doer is like the man who observes his natural face in a mirror. He observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer this one will be blessed in what he does. If any of you thinks he is religious, but does not bridle his tongue and deceives his own heart, this man's religion is useless. True and undefiled religion is this, up before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. I'd like to share a passage from one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, Romans 8. Romans 8 was the first full chapter that I memorized, and today it fills my heart with hope. I pray it will do the same for you. I'll be reciting from the English Standard Version. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with the pains of childbirth until now. And not creation only, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons the redemption of our bodies. For by this hope, we were saved. But hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, 
We wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we don't know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or the sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth nor powers, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. As we are painfully dealing with the sad reality of Dad's accident and his consequent death, It's our prayer today that somehow through our time um, that this will ultimately be a celebration, not just of his life, but of our remarkable God that we serve. We wanna thank you again for being here. It's a great comfort for mom and the entire family. Your love is indeed helping us deal with the pain. There is pain at this time. We thank you for being here. Speaking of the pain, it seems it would be good just for a moment to give context to its origins. The Bible tells us of a created being that became jealous of Jesus, who became jealous of the Creator, the one that had given him life and sustained his life. Unbridled selfishness and the pride that Lucifer had led him to a point of no return, and ultimately that led to sin and pain and death. We can't be confused on this item. It's important for us, especially as a family right now. In Genesis, our loving creator formed Adam out of the dust of the earth. He breathed his breath into Adam's nostrils. And the Bible says that this combination, Adam and uh, he became a living soul with this combination. He became a human being. Shortly thereafter, Lucifer begins to work his plan to undermine, to confuse, to accuse. You will not surely die, he says to Eve, and that successful deception has ultimately created a pathway for the sin and the death, the horrific reality which we experience. Satan's introduction of sin has created the conditions for aging, for disease, and ultimately for death. The Bible actually says the wages of sin is death. Fortunately, it doesn't stop there, right? It goes on, it says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Praise the Lord. Would you say that with me? Praise the Lord. This is why we can actually celebrate today. This is why. But how do you do it? How do you summarize a life of 83 years in the span of 83 minutes. How do you do that? I'm not speaking for 83 minutes. Relax, I 
that was the approximate length of this service, give or take 15 minutes. I don't know how we're doing, but um, I hope you don't have anywhere to go just yet. But words, words. I feel so inadequate to choose words today. I strangely revert back to those grade school years, you might remember, having immature playground conversation about whose dad is the greatest, each one trying to share what they admired about their dad so much and trying to get others to understand. Alas, I've overcome this temptation, this playground temptation. What I've, what I've done is I've started listening. I've started listening to the words that I'm hearing, words from many of you, words that are printed in cards, words that are typed in social media describing dad's life. Here's some words I'm hearing. Encouraging, energetic, a doer, genuine, disciplined, generous, happy, dignified, humble, ingenious, available, respect, inventive, practical, admirable, perfect posture, <laughs> and that he adored his family. These are the things I'm hearing a good friend who was a pastor many years ago in Port Charlotte, who many of you know, uh, Gordon Retzer. He wrote a letter to mom and addressed it to the entire family, and he's, he reflected about my dad. He said, this word just comes to me. This word is helpful. Helpful. He was always helpful. As busy as he constantly was, he was always helpful. Interesting, in the Bible, when the mother of James and John was politicking that her sons would get notable positions, Jesus shared these words in Matthew 20, verses 25. Whoever wants to become great among you shall be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave. And just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. There's a lot in this passage, and we've seen some of that in Dad. The family today is grateful that Dr. David Smith from Southern Adventist University, the president here, um, is present and also wishes to share just a few words in this regard. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. It's actually my privilege and honor to participate in this service. Um, I wouldn't have known how to request it, but I'm pleased that I was asked. This is the third service for the Lang family that I've had a part in. I think one in the Dakotas, one in Lincoln, and now one here in Collegedale. And in each of those services, including this one, I have been reminded what a special family this is. It's not only large, but it's special in any way you want to define it. And the loss that we feel today, as well as what we celebrate, is special for all of us. So I extend condolences from the university, as former pastor of this church, from this church as well, uh, and from your other family and friends uh, who grieve with you. One of my favorite texts in scripture is Matthew 20, 28. It addresses Jesus and why he came to earth. And it says that he didn't come to be served, which if you think about it from the start of birth, most of us as babies understand that's our purpose in life is to be served and we let it be known. And many of us may not mature from that point of view through life, but Jesus didn't come to be served, he came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It occurs to me the truth of what was recited by Bob Lang in James chapter one, to be doers of the word and not just hearers of the word, that his own life exemplified living out service and not just talking about it. I think that one word perhaps could encapsulate so much about him 
to simply serve. This past Friday, I was in the local Walmart, an experience those of us who live in college, they'll often have, and I ran across a student from Southern Adventist University. And I asked, what are you doing for Thanksgiving? What is, what is going on for you? Just making small talk. And discovered that here was a young man, I think possibly his wife, maybe girlfriend with him, wasn't sure, but they and 13 other students had decided that they were going to spend their Thanksgiving break going down to Clarksville, Georgia to serve the immigrant population there. And I thought to myself, wow, not everybody's wired that way. A lot of us would want to be with our families. We would want to be together. It's a great opportunity for us to be so meaningful, but to choose to let that go and to want to serve other people more than anything else you might want is pretty remarkable, but I think that is exactly what Bob Lang exemplified. He served as a, as a volunteer in our volunteer ministry at the university for several years and distinguished himself in his service, probably not a surprise to anyone who knew, knew him. I think he reported about 1,000 hours of service, but all of our volunteers seriously underreport their hours. So I, suggest, I suspect there were thousands of hours that he volunteered. And what did he do? Well, he helped with a lot of things, but one of them really strikes me. Uh, just sitting here today, I thought, how perfect, because he really worked very well with our school of nursing, acting out as a patient. And I thought, for a former doctor, how good would that be? You could live out those symptoms and, and help those nursing students really understand what this condition would be like. And I may not be remembering right, but I think that I am, that one day I walked over there while they were having a simulation, and there he was in bed, uh, and they were hovering around him, curing him from something. And I thought to myself, good for him. That's, that's pretty, pretty amazing. He was, of course, a gardener. We have a school garden. He helped us with that. He was a host, a mentor. And actually, in 2017, not long ago, he won the Volunteer Commitment Award. Someday I have to believe that in addition to catching up on what has been said here about him, as he will learn in heaven about that, he will also hear the words we know so well, so fitting for him, from Matthew 25, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I'm going to share just a few other words uh, before we close that I've been hearing. Uh, Dad was disciplined in virtually every way in his life and uh, left a real uh, challenge for those of us that follow to do likewise. He was very disciplined. He, from his early days um, in North Dakota, um, and, and the grandchildren probably won't recognize their grandfather in this story, but because he came from the greatest generation where you had to work and make life work, in our early years, um, I recall, uh, and all of us recall, his uncanny ability uh, to come right alongside of us in profound ways. Because he wanted things to be done and get done, uh, he was not amused with laziness in his children at all. Not amused, not even one little bit. Um, he had this uncanny ability to come alongside and grab your earlobe in stride and be projecting a message directly down your ear canal that would impact your brain in such remarkable ways. And it was amazing because the message was, in fact, always deserved. Always deserved. Sometimes it was punctuated by a kick in the pants to help get us going immediately in the right direction. And he would say things like this, when it is time to work, work. He would say, get it done right, feel good about it, and then move on to other things. As has already been mentioned, these are some of the lessons we really appreciate, Dad, taking the time to teach us. Um, he never spoiled us. Um, Doctors, kids of our generation, it seemed like they had so much stuff, you know. We wanted motorcycles too, right? Well, Dad uh, never gave us things, but he encouraged us if we wanted them to earn them. And so sure enough, that made us industrious, and eventually we did get dirt bikes, and, and he did too. 
and it was a lot of fun. Dad was a doer. That was one of the words that I've heard so much. And the truth is he could literally do anything, and he taught us to believe that we could too. He very rarely paid for someone to do what he knew he could do or what he knew we could do. <laughs> um, how many successful doctors do you know that upholster their own furniture? I mean, really, just stop and think about it. How many successful doctors buy a shell cargo van and customize it into a cross-country family dream machine? No kidding, it really was amazing. And when my dad would park it at the doctor's parking lot next to Lamborghinis and Porsches and whatnot, actually one time I came home from school and he borrowed the Lamborghini of one of his doctor colleagues and took me for a ride. You know, the Lamborghini has the doors that go, you get in and then they come down and then you go for a ride and it's an amazing car. But we pulled into the parking lot and dad said, it's a pretty cool car. I said, that was an awesome ride, Dad. I said, but the seats are kind of uncomfortable. It's kind of claustrophobic in here. And Dad said, it's really not real practical, is it? We got out. I looked at the van, and I thought, I really do prefer the van. Because we did it, and we saved about a quarter of a million dollars. When we got deeper into our teen years, um, we worked construction for local contractors in the summers, and the miracle Dad was hoping for, it finally took place. We, we actually thrived working with him. <laughs> we actually enjoyed working with him, and we actually were amazed at what we could get done. His ingenuity, his work ethic from North Dakota Farm were just amazing. Generous. Generous, he was very generous. He paid a double tithe for many years helping the local church on virtually every project, helped so many individuals that were in need, helped people start their own businesses at times. Recently, he was buying a wheelchair at the Samaritan Center to help shut-ins come to this church. He asked, how much is that wheelchair? And they said, well, that's $5. That'll, that'll be $5. And he handed them 50 and said, I'm sorry, I just can't pay less. Generous. This will be hard for me to share, but I'd, I'd like to try. Um, one time I was building a house in Portland, Oregon. My brother came out, we worked. Uh, he came out a couple weeks, and um, then the next thing I know, dad wants to come out and work for an entire month. Now he's still practicing medicine. He's taking a whole month out because he wants to come help build a house. It was really amazing, it was awesome. We were up on the ladder jacks putting cedar siding on, and kind of out of nowhere, Dad says, hey, Rob, I wish I would have been a better dad when you were younger. And I said, what? Are you kidding me? And I listed all the stuff that he did. He kind of had a tear in his eye, and I, I just said, you have got to be kidding. I said, Dad, you have been a role model in every way. I said, you are a great dad. These are tears of joy because I'm so blessed. Please understand. After a long pause, we're up on the ladder jacks, and he says, well, maybe I was the one that missed out. Maybe I got too busy. And I said, maybe, but don't ever think for one minute that you've not been a great dad. He was humble, always very humble. He was humble by choice. He could have been wealthy, but he chose otherwise. He could have lived in such a way that he would have been on a completely different path than he chose. He, 
He chose the modest practical path, the, the narrow path of all cars that he could choose to commute to work. He chose a Toyota Corolla. Somebody say amen. He chose a Toyota Corolla. And that's a great car, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying this kind of illustrates. And he was always so pleased that it got 40 plus miles to the gallon. He was just thrilled about this. And he was really excited because he put way over 200,000 miles on it. Yep, yep. That just made so much sense to dad. He adored his family. He adored his children equally. You've heard already so much. Um, but it should be noted that he, he really adored Velvet, Cinda, and Paul, um, the spouses of his children. They were each so dear to him. As dad's life progressed, he increasingly chose to pursue God's heart. He was not always a perfect man, and I think that's the story that needs to be heard today. He was a good man, a hardworking man, but as his life progressed, he chose to continually pursue God's heart. And so it is that God was able to work in his life so clearly The bitterly cold winters of North Dakota farm and somewhat frigid nonverbal love of a German home took more than half a lifetime for him to thaw out from, but thaw he did. And it should be noted too, that dad deeply loved his parents and respected them and his sisters and vice versa. But it was a culture of nonverbal affection there, that didn't exist. It should be noted too that dad has said many, many times that it was his faithful, loving, and forgiving wife that warmed his heart and conveyed God's love. And while he had been a rather impatient man in his early years, as he experienced Jesus' love, as he became a true disciple of his word, as the years progressed, the spiritual atmosphere mom provided for her four children began to soften dad's heart and his faith grew right along with ours. So, how do you measure the life of a man? I would suggest to you it's measured by how much they allow God's love, how much they allow the truth in Scripture to impact their life. And that's what we celebrate today in Dad. And so it is because of God's love that this beautiful story of his life and our family and the love that we share that it's not over. The Bible calls death asleep. Dad sleeps. He rests in the nail-scarred hands of Jesus. We can be sure of this. He no longer has to toil in the things of this world. And the Bible says that when the harvest is full, Jesus will come. A full harvest is that point in time when all who will repent and all who will accept God's gift of forgiveness and salvation, it's when that point occurs. And at that point, I believe Jesus comes directly. I believe that it's at that point that he'll put an end to the nonsense of sin, of death, sorrow, and separation. 1 Thessalonians 4 is a classic for us. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. So you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus, all those who have fallen asleep. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That'll be dad. After that, we who are still alive and our left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Encourage one another with these words. One final passage, 1 Corinthians 15. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be rise, raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 
for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and when this mortal shall have put on immortality, this is when this whole event happens, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is going to be an amazing event that Hollywood cannot even fathom. They can't even try to demonstrate what it's going to be like when Jesus comes with all of his angels and the trump sounds and the dead in Christ arise and, and we come up together. And I just, I just, we already know what dad's going to say. We already know what he's going to say. His blue eyes are going to open and twinkle again. And this is what he's going to say. He's going to say, can you believe it? Can you believe this? Boy, oh boy, I tell you. Even so, come Lord Jesus, may we all be there, and to God be the glory. Well, I should go change my clothes and get out here, but I've got, uh... No, I'm... It's time to quit. <laughs> We're gonna get her done. So we had the 28 Chevy truck without a door on the driver's side. The day before I was six, Dad said, you have to come out and drive it from one end to the other. I could slide down there and hit the clutch and put it in gear and the RPMs were there. I could let it out slowly and then I could hop up and see where you're going. <laughs> drive, down, drive down to the end of the... Could you reach the brake?
going to learn to do today, Hector? We're going to learn to make the cheese on the mat à la mode. That's French for a cheese omelet. takes a few bugs to get uh, worked out here so that the flow is right. Whereas since the counter is far enough away, since this is a larger room, so that we will need to put a, a shelf over here for some of the frequently used things in, a, in an examination. soul I 
trees and I went to the front yard and I looked around and there wasn't much happening and I thought well I'm going to go around to the back of the house because in the back of the house there's always something to look at so I went around the back of the house and you've been there and I looked down the creek both directions at grandma and grandpa's house When we went to the rally here and saw what AWR is doing and how they could get into areas where, as far as I know, no other ministries can, can reach. And uh, some of the stories that were given with Cami and uh, places they've gone in Duane, that really impressed me. And I said, this is a really worthy ministry. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith brings forth patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. We enjoy you to, we invite you to sing with us again. Just um, the faith we have in God is so precious, never more precious than now. Um, we're going to lift our voices one more time.
Thank you, Lang family and friends, and Don, thank you for the beautiful music. Wow. We didn't know the uh, Langarosa at first. It was going to Bob and Retha's, and Kathy, uh, we were, that, Retha, that was uh, the best place to go. <laughs> Coming home from the mission field, you, Bob would always take time. From his busy schedule, and he always had time for us. Going to Disney or taking us on boat rides or down the, down the river looking for crocs or whatever. Yes, down the canal when you Alligators, first lived, rather. lived in Orlando. Uh, we, <laughs> we were missionaries in Africa, so we saw. <laughs> and by the way, you came to Africa. Yeah. Botswana. Yeah, Botswana and uh, built a church, added the second church, 
and Bob helped, and then the medical clinics had several doctors. And physical therapists, and then the meetings, the evangelistic meetings at and, night. And by the way, we had two churches then a few years ago, and now we had 22 in Mound, Botswana, thanks to, to what started there. They've told us that because we were there. God inspired them to do a lot more, Rob. That's right. And then there was Bonaire, um, Todd. That was a great experience and a very interesting place. Hard work there. Um, Costa Rica, Kathy. Yes, I preached my first evangelistic series in Kenya. And when I came home, I called Bob and I said, Bob, you have to do this. You know, we have a perception of, of ourselves and we think that we cannot be up in front. We can't express ourselves. But we can do this. The Holy Spirit will work in and through us. Please come to Costa Rica. Now remember, this is the Lane family from North Dakota, and they're never up front, never doing this, and changed your life. Changed my life and changed Bob's life too, I believe. I, I think what you said to him was? That it's not about us, but it's about God. And then he went to the most difficult place, the place where police wouldn't go after dark. That's right, and it, it poured so hard that his sight flooded, and on Sunday he went out and built a trench around Himself. The, the site where the audience would sit. He, he took a, a shovel and went on himself and fixed it himself. That's right. And when I went out, he said to me, because I was coordinating the meetings, he said to me, Kathy, don't come to my meeting first. Give me a little time speaking first. And so I did, and I went on Sunday night, and I was blown away. Bob was there greeting his guests, and when he stood up to preach. He preached from memory, had it memorized, and Kathy was so impressed that her, her big brother, because Bob was the big brother, 14 years older, and uh, it was... A very special, 12, 12, 12 years, years. Yeah. You know, a very special relationship That's that right. uh, you had for many years. Uh, Rita, you guys always enjoyed the kids too when we come home from Africa and show pictures, tell stories, and Bob would always say, can you believe it? <laughs> and he'd say, wowie, zowie. <laughs> <laughs> and he does the same. When we get back, we, we travel a lot with Adventist World Radio when we get back from trips. He'd say, wow, well, he's wait, 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 when wait. I when talk I, to him. When I get on the phone and talk to my family or friends, mine is short. But Bob and Kathy have this thing. It's not a story unless you tell all the details. <laughs> <laughs> and when you're finished, you, he would always say, Wowie, zowie. Yeah. Shall we stand for prayer? Little Kathy, as she was small, and big brother would go off to school to Union College or Loma Linda or get married. She would always run and hide because she couldn't say goodbye. One day, one day, one day, when Jesus comes, there will be no more goodbyes. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we look for that day when this family will be reunited. Yes, and I'm sure Papa will say, can you believe it? Wow, what a day that will be. There will be no more pain or sorrow or crying. All the tears will be wiped away. We're looking for Jesus to come. Keep us until that day. In his name, I pray. Amen.